Everybody, welcome to Fortitude, man. This is, this is a great episode that I've been mm -hmm. waiting for years to bring to you. I have um, somebody that I met back in 1988. And uh, our studio, hey, real, it's real podcast world, man. I mean, <laughs> studio's falling apart already. But anyway, it is my honor to bring to you, I don't like to say former, because to me, once you're a Navy SEAL, you're always a Navy SEAL. I mean, uh, you, so I'm here with, with Navy SEAL Randy Beaujolais, and uh, he's been, this is actually, I told him today that I'm actually, now I'm able to check off one of my <laughs> bucket lists. And he laughs at me. But, but yeah, so, but I, I appreciate got to, that. But so, you're making my head swell. <laughs> so here's the... Here's something I want people to know that I, you know, that I tell everybody when, uh, when I told them that we were able to, uh, to meet again or, or to, to hook back up and, and talk. And that was whenever I sent you that email and I'm like, because I was, let me back up. So I was watching Never Quit with, with Latrell, and I heard him say, let me tell you something about this. The biggest badass seal there is out there, Randy Bush. I'm like, that's Randy. So, so I started, so I started searching around a little bit. Well, somehow or another, with I come across Don Shipley, mm -hmm. found you there, and then did mm -hmm. a little bit more research. Google's a wonderful thing. Found out that you're with Old 18. Mm -hmm. Found your email and sent you an email. Three months went by, and I'm like, oh well, he doesn't remember me. He's too busy or whatever. And all of a sudden, here comes this email in, like, John, man, I'm so sorry. So anyway, <laughs> long story short, I give Randy a call. Said, hey, I'm coming to see my sister in Dallas. I'm gonna swing through Houston area. I'd like to see you. We'll catch up. And uh, where are you staying? Oh, I'll grab some. No, man, just stay here. And I'm like, so I tell people, I have not seen you since 1982 on board the USS Hermitage, which is where we met. Well, actually, green water workups before then. Yeah. But anyway, long story short, <clears throat> here we are, and uh, uh, it's an honor, brother. I appreciate, I appreciate it to, to come on and tell Same your story. You. So this is going to be a two-part thing. So uh, we're also going to do a little something later on where we have a three-panel with Lucky Riley, mm. who's Randy's business partner. We're going to talk about... The book side and old 18 a little bit. We'll touch a little bit on, on the book and, and a few things there. But I just want to I want to set the stage and let everybody know a little bit about you. Absolutely. Uh, uh, so anyway, again, it's our it's our honor. First of all, uh, when we met last time, we talked a little bit. I like to let people know kind of what uh, your childhood was like and where you were raised. Phoenix, Arizona. Land of constant sun. So I thought you was gonna say constant sorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no, constant sun. Uh, yeah, born and raised in Phoenix till I was 18. I went in the Navy. So my dad was a cop. Mom was a housewife, and basically I lived in the pool in the backyard. So. So was your dad local, state? Uh, he was a county. He was a Phoenix police, with the Phoenix Police Department, basically. So. So, and his beat was the airport, Sky Harbor Airport area. So, really? Yeah. Man, a lot of those cop shows come out of that area. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so when you were in high school there, were sports, was that part of your... I swam, man. I hated, I, I still to this day hate football and baseball. I know people can <laughs> roast me all they want, but I cannot stand watching that. And I don't know... I think that's what, because all my older brothers and my dad used to watch everything, and I could never watch the little kid shows I wanted to watch. So, um, are you the baby? The I'm family? second from the baby. My, I have a brother that's three years younger. So, how many siblings? Five of us total, so four all siblings, boys? three, four boys total, and three, and one girl. Sorry. God bless your Get sister my and your mom. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, wow. My mom and my sister are still ganging up on me. So. so you um, did you did you swim in school? Was that yeah, a... so I swam. Swimming and football are obviously at the same time. I'd rather swim. Did really well. Um, had swimming scholarships when I was getting out of high school and just did not see myself going that route. So I kind of waned and wobbled around in that summer when I graduated, and then finally my dad was like, "You can keep on living. You just can't live here. So you better do something." So I enlisted in the Navy, and off I went. 
<laughs> so here's a little bit of tidbit information. Uh, That's funny. I went in, I went through RT, I went in to RTC San Diego in September, September 10th of 82. You went to Great Mistakes in November of 82. November of 82. Yeah. And so that that's I didn't know that till I started read till I read your book as well. So with your dad being a police officer and him telling you, hey, you're not gonna stay, that's what my dad did. My dad, well, being from West Virginia, there you had three options. You went south to North Carolina, you went to school, or you went in the military. Mm -hmm. So I did I what didn't have the grades to go yeah, to school, so I went to military. What doesn't make sense is my dad let my younger brother live there till he was thirty. <laughs> My brother above me and my sister, they both stayed there until mid-20s. So why did I have to leave at 18? <laughs> Were you a problem child, Randy? I didn't, think, I didn't think so. I thought it was delightful. But obviously uh, my parents thought differently. So Now, was there a history of military in your family? Well, or? my dad was uh, in the Army in World War II. So. Really? Yeah. What did he do in the Army? He was a uh, bunker buster, if that makes any sense. They would jump in and... You know, Bangalore, Bangalore torpedoes into the bunkers and stuff. When so. a breacher was really a breacher. Yeah, when you were blowing up bunkers <laughs> so uh, in the Pacific Theater. So. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. I had no. So, so that was pretty much your influence for going into the military. Yeah, but I also there. had a uh, swimming coach who said he was a SEAL in Vietnam. I've never really been able to confirm that. I actually thought about that the other day of, of trying to confirm whether he was or not. It really doesn't matter if he was or not. But, you know, he told me all about SEALs, I guess you could say. Um, and I, I really wanted to do something different, something special, something uh, special ops related. And that was before there were, you know, special ops and this and that. The Army did not intrigue me at all. Neither did the Marine Corps. Um, I wanted to to do something different, and I was a really good swimmer, so the whole SEAL thing made the most sense to me. Plus, no matter who you talk to at that point even, and they were talking about spec ops, it was always, well, there's SEALs, and then there's the rest of them. And so that was, that kind of sealed the deal for me, you know. How did you find out about the SEAL program? Basically, the swimming coach. So I didn't, I didn't coach. know they. So it wasn't. A, it wasn't a, the movie, the SEAL team, and everybody. There was so nothing there out there. Nothing I think at there. that point there was probably Tommy Keith's book. Um, I think would probably be the only one that was out there. Men with green faces. Um, I think he was in that, and I don't remember if he wrote it or not. But um, that was probably the only one out there. But I never, I never even knew they existed. I didn't even know who they were, what they were, until my swimming coach started talking to me about it, and then. Uh, and he was the assistant swimming coach, and that intrigued me. And then I started looking into it, asking around. But there was no literature, there was no internet, there was no, there was no way to get anything. And actually, seals at that point were very secretive, you know. So there was very little information out there about seals, and you know, or anything like that. So the only thing I knew about Navy seals when I was, when I was growing up was. Uh, an acquaintance that we have, somebody was an instructor when you went through right. with my cousin. So uh, with David, I mean, that was, and even with David, we didn't, we didn't know a whole lot. I mean, David was, right. he was very tight-lipped, and which he should be. I mean, not, you know, Seals until. Seals actually did what they were supposed to do back then. Until Obama so. was taken out, nobody knew six even existed. Well, everybody had an idea, but yeah. it wasn't announced publicly. But anyway, yeah. I, I digress. Uh, so. You were, um, is that Lucky? Huh? Here's somebody else. Sorry. That's my wife, probably. So it, 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 it's, it's a podcast. We don't care. Um, so anyway. Let me go shut them up for you. No. <laughs> yeah, let's go see some of this stuff. I want to get into your shoulder, by the way. Don't let me forget it. Chad's going to love that story. Everybody's going to love the story about your shoulder. Um, uh, That's funny. When I told my wife that, she said, what? Um. So the things have changed a lot from when you and I went in the military, especially with BUDS. You had to go to boot camp. There was no guarantee that you could go. There was no guarantees for BUDS back then, no. right? You ended up going to A school, whatever job you wanted to do in the Navy, and it had to be a source rating for SEALs if you wanted to go. There were certain ratings they didn't allow to go to BUDS. Um, <clears throat> I was at ET, and that was one of the source, rating, source ratings. So 
I mean, it, that worked out. But you had to go to A school first, and then most of the time you had to go to the fleet and then go to BUDS. But there were, there were ways of taking the screening test in BUDS and then going to your A school, then going to BUDS. So you could do that, but there were no programs like Zero to Hero. You're going in the Navy to become a SEAL. There was nothing. There was a guy on board the shaft. His last name was Knox. I can't remember what his first name was. He was, he was one of them buff guys. You know, think they're going to go through that looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but when they finally get there, they don't. Yeah, most of them guys quit. Yeah, well, he yeah. rang the bell. We found out later that he, he didn't he didn't so, stick it. If you talk to anybody who, you know, left Buds, and they got dropped medically or something, but they all ring the bell. Yeah, you know, that's. There's very few guys that leave Buds because of medical or something. So, so we know what inspired you to be. So the inspiration to become a Navy SEAL was it a challenge? Was it was it just something you you just felt in your gut you wanted to do? Was it? A, I think it's all of that. Um, I really. I really enjoyed the thought of being on a special unit that very few people know about and going and doing things that very few people ever hear about and and actually winning, you know, in other words, going against the enemy and winning at their own game. And that was the right. cool thing about SEALs in Vietnam is that SEALs in Vietnam were the first, in my opinion, the first unit, uh, at least that I've heard about that fought the enemy in their own backyard using their own tactics, which was which was very different from other special ops units at the time. So um, that really intrigued me. That's awesome. So, so you joined as an ET. We talked a little bit earlier about going to the nuclear program. That was me, right? So that was a six-year program, they called it. So it was 6YO. As after all your little junk when uh, <clears throat> when they are looking in your record. And the six YOs were not allowed to go to BUDS because the Navy was going to spend a whole bunch of money training you because you're in this six-year-long program. So you're mandatory to be in the Navy six years. Most everybody else is four. Right. So not knowing that you couldn't go from nuclear power to SEAL team, you know, I went in as an ET, and then I had my little stint waiting for nuke school, and then I went down to nuke school. And as we talked about, and we will not divulge in this podcast, but <laughs> I found a way to get out of nuke school without uh, dropping my, without DORing or quitting, whatever you want to call it. I found a way to get out of nuke school and get to the screening test and get to BUDS. Um, and actually, there was a technicality. So when I came into the Navy and, you, and you're an ET program, you actually were E3 out of BUDS. Everybody else is an E1. And... ET program, even though it was a four-year program, was a, was still a harder program. A school alone is nine months, ten months long. So, um, ET is electronics technician. If nobody oh, knows. Right. Should, it's gonna anyway, be... uh, long story short is it's such a long program from E3 to E4. The time and rate I think back then was like six months, nine months, whatever. But in the ET field, they had so few of them that they they reduced that to like three months. So when I was in in ET school. I actually took the rating exam to make E4. Wow. Most people waited until they graduated from ET school because at graduation you were automatic E4. So that was the difference between ET and some of these other ratings was you could go from boot camp to A school and be an E4 when you graduate, which is a pretty good deal. That's in, a pretty good that bump point. in money. Right. So, but I took the, the rating exam and I made E4. And so I put on E4 before I ever graduated from ET school. So in reality, technicality, but in reality, I was no longer in the six-year program because one of the six years in that six-year program was automatic E4 out of A school. So technically, I was no longer in the six-year program because I <laughs> took the screening test. So I used that to my advantage and I actually took the, they did the same thing for E5 and they reduced the time and rate, I think was a year they reduced it to six months. So while I was waiting for new school, I took the E5 exam. And when I was at new school, I actually, I actually made E5, didn't know it until the day I showed up at Bud's. And the uh, admin guy at Bud's, a little Filipino guy, he's like, oh, he goes, you made E5. Go to the, go to the exchange and buy, your, buy, buy some crows for your E5. <laughs> and he, I, like that day I was in E5, the day I showed up at Bud's, it was kind of funny. 
So I finagled my way through technicalities out of the nuclear power program. Wow, so when you graduated Buzz and some of that special pay started rolling in, you were, you were, you were I was a really you young, hurting. really young E5, so. That's, yeah. So all that aside, you, you work your way to get to what you want. You want to, you want to go to Buzz. Yep. Now, <clears throat> the grinder, so that you all know, Chad, wanted me to make sure that I, because of today's thing, a grinder means so many things. A grinder is where they grind you into the concrete <laughs> with your that. PT sessions. That's called the grinder. Right. So when you, and you have to walk across the grinder your very first day, you see the bell, that the, the notorious yeah. bell. What is that old crap moment? What does, ex describe us what that old crap moment felt like. What, how, what was that like for mm -hmm. the very first time? Well, as a pre-trainee, you're really not, you're really not hanging out in the grinder. You're always out in the grass by the beach or whatever the, the salt grass and the stuff like that the ice plant they called it uh, you're always kind of out of the compound because you're really not in you're not classed up you're not wearing a helmet as a pre-training so none of that really hit me until it didn't hit me until I classed up shaved my head put my helmet on and I remember the first event on the first day of first phase was a two-mile run in the soft sand now I'm a swimmer. I never ran a day in my life, right? I, the screening test was actually the longest I had run ever in my life because I was always a swimmer. I never did football, baseball, none of that stuff, you know? So as far as like going out and running, I didn't run four miles any time in my life. So and everybody's like, well, where'd you go to Bud's? And it's like, well, I didn't view Bud's as, well, it, it's gonna be really hard because I have to run four miles or six miles or whatever. I didn't even know you did a 14-mile run in Buds until I got to Buds. But um, long story short, I never really looked at the the individual events or the things you would have to do because I I was such a good swimmer. I'm like, they got to take that into consideration. So, with that said, at on that first two-mile run, I was literally the last person out of 128, and I was breathing like a lung shot buffalo and. Uh, I, that's when I'm like, man, this is not going to be as fun as I thought it was. So, but I, I kept that. I did actually all the way through Buds. I was the worst runner ever. I think that went to Buds. So I was always last, and I was always, you know, barely passing my timed runs. But I still passed. So that's the critical point. The key factor of all of this is I was still a seal, even though I was the worst runner ever. Well, there's even to this day when you. The books that I've been reading about some of these guys, uh, the Eddie Penny, I mean, I was asking you about Eddie Penny, you, see, you know, really didn't have a lot of, these are the newer guys, the Adam Browns, um, uh, these are guys who are Christians now, they're a the, the great insp inspiration to me. But when you hear them talk about, just like in your book, when they get there, the first thing they're doing, they're sizing guys up, and we're gonna, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, it's all part of the mindset. And, but I, one of the things that, that I've just, I'm kind of curious about is when you went back to being an instructor, because it was, you had, you'd been in the teams for quite some time yeah. before you went back. How, how had it changed? Was, were you shocked? I mean, were, were you, were you pretty pleased with what you saw or what you found or were you a little Man, this has changed a lot since I was here. Hadn't changed much at all. So the, really? you, you mentioned the grinder, right? When I went to Bud's, I had one big barracks right behind the, between the beach and the grinder. Three stories tall, all three classes were first, you know, first phase at the bottom, second phase in the middle, third phase at the top. So, um, and the grinder was completely open and empty. It was just an L-shaped building, maybe, you know, a U-shaped building, and that was all of Bud's. First phase, Second phase and third phase was kind of nestled next to first phase, um, but you spend most of the time at San Clemente Island for third phase. So, with that said, the grinder was just huge. It was open. When I went back, they had put two huge buildings, admin buildings, on the grinder. The grinder was still plenty big enough to run classes, but it was definitely smaller than when I went there. And those buildings kind of block your view of the beach from the grinder. Not that you need a view from the beach, but you know it's a lot easier to get out to the water back then. But um, 
long story short, the first thing I did the day I got two buds, the turnover that I thought would take a week took about 10 minutes. The warrant officer that was running the phase when I got there spent about 10 minutes, man. He was on his way. He wanted to get out of there. And so my, you know, my turnover lasted like literally like 10 minutes. So I walked across the grinder and I got my buds record. And the lady that was in the um, admin records for the students was the lady that was there when I went through buds. I mean, it had been 15, 16 years, you know. But anyway, so I got my record, went back to my little desk, and I opened my record. And you always think you did a lot. I thought I did a lot worse in buds than I really did. But what I was looking for is I needed a, a really good snapshot of how I actually did in buds. So I opened it up. In the very beginning, I had failed. You know, you, you got to think you do a time run every week, and first phase is nine weeks long. So nine timed runs or whatever, I think I failed four or five of those out of out of the nine. But I passed four or five of them, you know. I don't remember what the number was. None of the comments in my record were really derogatory. They weren't personal. It was just like, fantastic swimmer, horrible runner, you know. And, and it, so it was comments like that. And everybody goes to a board, I guess you could say. I think it was right before Hell Week or something. And they scream and they tell you they're going to kick you out and all that kind of stuff because you're a terrible runner. But everybody else that I talked to, they screamed at them about something else. So I knew it was just kind of a game that they were playing. And I never went to another board after that, if you will, you know. But I just, I knew that it was going to be, you know, a huge challenge and all that kind of stuff. But I, I, when I looked at my record after that, it was just, you know, I either passed or I failed. There were very few things. Academically, it was great, all that stuff. But second and third phase were, were not as hard as first phase. But first phase is taking you from nobody to you know, someone who physically can handle the rest of the course, you know what I'm saying? And Hell Week's in there, six week-ish, and depending on when you went through Buds. But I looked at my record, and I looked at all the events, because it had every event, I actually had a schedule for my Buds class, and I looked at that and compared that to the schedule we were currently running in Buds, and there were very few things that were different. So Buds from, in that 15 years, hadn't really changed that much. So, which I thought was great, but I, the perspective I got from looking at my own record helped me make sure that I could keep my instructors kind of from making buds harder than it needs to be. Buds is already hard enough, doesn't need to be any harder, and instructors certainly don't need to make it harder on the students than, than, they, than it needs to be. Did you keep your same swim partner, your swim buddy, did you keep him all, all the way, way through? All the way through buds, from day one to last day. Really? Ensign Herbert ended up becoming a captain. I think he was a CEO of buds before he moved on out of the Navy, but yeah, whole from day one to last day, it's in Herbert. So did you, do you see a... I he mean, wasn't as good of a swimmer as me, I'm kidding. He was probably better <laughs> than me. Um, we were great, great pair. And we, we kicked everybody's butt. Is there a common denominator in that to guys who keep their swim partner all the way through from ones who, you know, you're in hell week or and, I mean, and all of a sudden you're standing there and you don't see your swim buddy anymore. I mean, he's gone. He's rung the bell. Because, you know what I mean? Is there... I mean, it could have a mental effect depending on how you looked at that person. But um, I don't have any perspective because, like I said, I kept him the whole time. So. Well, it could. I'm saying you know. on the other foot, it could be something like, I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> it someone. could be. I mean, <laughs> I'm he's, glad he's, he's like an anchor. <laughs> yeah. But, no, he was super fast and we kicked everybody's butt. I don't care what Don Shipley says. <laughs> <laughs> about how great a swimmer he was. He was a great swimmer and oh a good Oh, my goodness. You know, so. I, I'm thankful. I, I, I crack up at, at, at him and his wife. I mean, they just, I love what he does. Yeah, they're good people. I, 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 him, Diane, I love, I love what Don he does. Don was fantastic in Buds, man. He was like in the fleet for like seven years before he showed up at Buds. It was fantastic. Was he like a stand-up comedian? I mean, he's, was he really he's funny? He's always comical, man. That boy is, <laughs> is always funny. So... <laughs> Oh, he, was, he was our comedic relief at Bud's. So. That, that is... Uh, definitely made it, I, I, he definitely made it easier. So he had a lot of, he had a great impact on a lot of people. So, so man. what phase probably give you your biggest challenge? First phase, right? Just where you... Just running, man. That gave me my challenge. I love Bud's. So the thought of me being on a ship or in a submarine or something else, man, that just... That just pained me to no end to think that I was just going to be average. 
you know, and I, have a, I had a huge fear of mediocrity, I think, at that point in my life. I don't now, but I did then. <laughs> um, but fear of mediocrity, right? I did not want to be mediocre. I just didn't want to be average. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be just that, the guy that did what everybody else does. So I think for me, you know, when I knew I was going to Bud's, I'm like, man, I get, to, I get to roll around the sand. I get to do things that nobody else can do. I'm going to jump out of helicopters and airplanes, and I'm going to dive under the water. I'm going to do all these blow things up and shoot guns and I'm gonna be this uh, you know, special warfare operator guy, and very few people get to do that. And that thrilled me to no end. So when I, when I got to Bud's, I knew I would graduate unless they kicked me out. There was no question in my mind. So that's what Lucky and I talk about a lot, and we talk about in the book, is you know, having that unwavering self-belief. Knowing that you, if somebody else has done it, I know I can do it. It's just a matter of I've got to get through the evolutions between day one and day 180, you know. Glad you brought that up. Because mental toughness is really a lot of what your book is about. I mean, yeah. getting in that, um, and I can't wait to talk to you about it because y'all brought up some stuff that I'm like, man, I, I've done that and I didn't realize what I was doing. Um, but... Do you feel that mental toughness is genetic? Is it a learned? Is it possibly both? I mean, because you have seen by being an instructor and going through Bud yourself, and I mean, there is every species, yeah. I mean, every type of person, every, um, what am I looking for? Uh, Walk of life. That... You look at somebody, you're probably thinking, there ain't no way that cat's going to make it. And he ended up being the top of the class. Or we're, Look at Chipley. You know. Done. <laughs> right? Smoked. Big old belly. You know, spider web elbows. You look at that guy and you're like, there's no way. And he was one of the best students. You know, it has nothing to do your, with your body type, your style. I have short legs. That's why I'm a terrible runner. It's all up here. Right? It? It's all about, do you believe? Do you believe that you can make it? If you believe you can make it, you will make it. It has nothing to do with anything else. That's why, personally, I think mental toughness can be taught, right? People ask me, well, what, what did you do in your childhood that made, that made it so that you could make it through buds and become a seal and everything else? And, you know, I have to attribute it to my parents. And that <clears throat> it's not like they tested me or did anything. It's just when I said I want to do something, like we had a pool in the backyard. It was 32 feet by 16 feet, just an average pool and I'm like I'm gonna swim all the way across but and hold my breath they didn't say oh no don't do that stop <laughs> you're gonna die and they're like okay go and you know with the, we'll resuscitate you if you don't yeah make. pretty much it's kind of like that and every time I'm, I want to climb we used to go to uh, Cave Creek and all that stuff outside of Phoenix and there was all these big boulders and sandstone out there and everything and we'd go climbing up those things and my dad was never told no Right? I was told no that yes, you gotta eat your vegetables and you gotta do this and you gotta do that. No, you can't be an idiot. But when it came to something physical, I was never told no. It was just like, well, go do it. And I broke arms and did stupid stuff and broke bones and my parents took me to the doctor, set them and sent me on my way. You know, so I never really had in my head the belief that I couldn't do something because I had done so much. Maybe that's why my dad kicked me out. It was kinda <laughs> You know, you need to fly, fly, butterfly, you know. <laughs> but um, when I got to Bud's, I knew I would make it unless they kicked me out. There was no question in my mind. So I don't know if I answered the question. No, you did. You but, did. You did. Yeah, it's perfect. But mental toughness can be taught, right? That's what we, I was We're in this for. environment where everybody and their brother tells their, their kids, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't say this. You can't do that. And it's, it's the dumbest thing in the world. All you're doing is holding your kid back. I've always said about, and yeah. Chad's brother, R Richie's, R Richie is, he's amazing to me, what his accomplishments since he's been in the Air Force. And as Chad is a, when he was little old tiny thing, I've always told people that there's just something about him that, that his confidence that I've always said, if, if Chad would ever come to me and say, Dad, I'm going to be leaving the backyard next week, going to the moon. You better be calling NASA to get clearance because he's leaving the backyard. <laughs> uh, and, but, you know, at the same time, you know, you and I talked a little bit about what, it, 
what an accomplishment it was to me. Or, or I mean, it was like being a brain surgeon, really knowing now what the requirements are to go to SBU-20 or mm -hmm. to be part of the boat crew, uh, special uh, SBU-20, which is special boat unit 20 out of Little Creek. Um, I mean, you have to score like a thousand on, on whatever test, which when I went in would have been a hundred because there's only on the ASFAB, mm -hmm. it's only a hundred's top score. Uh, and knowing what I scored, so being able to go and do that when I did, it really it has helped me in a lot of different ways mm -hmm. to know now looking back that, yeah, that mindset can be, it can be learned. Uh, and it's, I was... Well, we. It can be. We have a responsibility as parents to keep our children safe, but we don't have a responsibility to be so risk averse that we we make them fearful of everything that's out there, right? Overprotective. I, well, it's not just yeah. I mean, take that to the extreme, though. I mean, I know I know some kids, man. If they leave their bedroom, their parents are freaking out because they're afraid they're going to get hit by a car on the highway that's 12 miles away. It's just it, to me, it's just crazy to instill fear in anybody and that's what controls people is fear and if you're not afraid to go try something then and and someone else has done it then you can do it too so 128 guys started buds and all the buff dudes that i was sizing up on the first day really wasn't sizing them up. i was just like who do i think is going to make it based on what i thought was required to make it through buds and I'd look at them and I'd go, that guy, that guy, that guy. And by the end of Hell Week, they were all gone. And at the end of training, you know, there were 24 of the original 128. Even though my class graduating size was bigger than that because we had rollbacks from the class before us. You but didn't get rolled, did you? you went I didn't straight get rolled. Through. Dom went straight, straight through. through too, didn't he? Yeah. So, um, but at the end, none of them dudes that I thought would, would make it did. It's because you can't size somebody up by what they look like. Right, you don't you don't have a clue about what's up in here, and what's up in here is the most important thing. You know, what they believe. So, who are some of your biggest influences through your different teams or platoons? And how, what, how did they? How did that come about? I mean, was as far there? As Pete, you're talking about guys that I served with. Yeah, or? guys you served with that, that probably that would have probably had the biggest influence on you as a as a as a new teamer. I was going to your first. You know, who were there guys out there that that they were old school that really had that influence on you that, that give, helped give you the drive and the confidence and the want to and the go that. For me, it was the. There are so many different skill sets in naval special warfare that you have to be good at. And I would find, I would find out who the best guy was in that particular skill set. So if it was jumping, it was Billy Mills and, and Pierre Ponson, um, as an example. And <clears throat> I would seek them out and I would pick their brain and I would go train with them. And anytime I could get on an event, I would go to where <clears throat> I could learn what they knew, you know? I mean, it was just the, it was just the way I did things, and then it, for shooting and for demolition and and all those things, I would who's the who's the best guy? Who's the guy that everybody goes to to get information from? And I would go seek them out, and I did that a lot, and I did it quickly. I didn't I didn't waste any time. I actually got to team two, and I had four months <clears throat> before I started STT. We talked about that. Now they have SQT, and it's all standardized. But at at that point, all the teams did their own individual here's here are the here are the ways we function uh, hand signals and how we shoot and how we blow things up and i had four months to wait and in that four months i ended up you know weaseling my way into getting free fall qualified and i was actually a free fall and static line jump master before i started stt can i stop you right there real months. quick because in your book if i'm not mistaken it's in the book you talked about how you wanted you couldn't fly the good shoots because there wasn't but just a few of them. So you had to go get so many jumps with these old round things that beat you to death. You couldn't go. It wasn't that I had to go do that. Right. It was just a, and when I got, again, when I got to Team 2, there was only nine MT1s, they called them. I think they still call them that. <clears throat> but it was the big square, 325 square foot ram air parachute that we would jump. We only had nine of them. And nobody wanted to jump the old paracommanders because they hurt when you open. 
I mean, they were, they opened quick and they had this big sleeve that came down and when that thing came off, man, that chute was open and it, it was painful. But there was a technique you could use to make it less painful. It was always painful. So it was wait until such a time that one of my platoons in the future did free fall training or something and or Pierre Ponce and Bill Mills gave me the option. You know, I was actually working in the parachute loft <clears throat> and they gave me the option. They're like, well, you can jump the old para commanders and go to free fall or you can wait until one day you can jump one of the ram airs because you ain't, as a new meet, you ain't jumping the ram airs. The so they gave me, I, I took 10 of those stupid things and the way we used to pack those dumb things back then was you actually kind of, to stretch the lines and everything, you kind of sat in the harness and we tied it off to the bumper of a car, got a line straight, and then we kind of flaked everything, packed them up, man. <clears throat> it sounds kind of hokey, but it's very similar to what you do with a ram air nowadays anyway. You're just laying it out on the ground. But I packed 10 of those things up, and I'd go out and I'd get 10 jumps in one day. One day. So... I got free fall qualified using those stupid para commanders instead of waiting for the ram airs. And then when we finally started getting a lot of ram airs, man, you know, then everybody was jumping them. But I was free fall qualified before I even got into SDT, way before I got into my first platoon. And I was actually a jump master, free fall jump master, and I was actually a rigger before uh, we deployed in my, next, my first platoon. So a lot of air ops quals that most guys take forever to get. You know, and it was just so funny, you know, guys would be like, man, you've been here for a long time. Because I had these quals that most guys didn't get till later on down the road. And I'm like, no. But that was my attitude, right? It was find the, find the people that knew way more than I did, it, knew more than everybody else, go train with them. And if you're eager, then they, they give you more, right? The more eager you are, the more training you get. I mean, that was my thing. My whole mentality was, well, it'll keep me alive and it'll keep the people that I'm working with alive. So <clears throat> a lot of people don't. Um, some of the, the older generation, they remember us going and getting Noriega, bringing him out. <clears throat> what they don't know is that the first and only combat swinter op, you pulled that off. Yeah. So in your book, you talked about how when you were pulled in, um, and you were the, were you the LP, you were the LPO? I was the LPO. LPO, LPO yeah. that, I, was, I was the LPO and senior enlisted because our chief um, didn't quite make it through and the training that we were doing. He had been out of the community for a long time, 19 years or something. This was kind of his twilight tour, and he was so out of training and out of shape that after about four months, he, you know, he was ushered out of the platoon. We went to all the other 29 senior chiefs, master chiefs, and chiefs at Team 2, and none of them wanted to be our chief. We, we had a little bit of a reputation, but it was, it was a good one, but we were also a little more wild than the rest of the guys at the team, and it was probably because of the youth of our, team, our, our platoon. Like I said, we only had three or four guys that had been in a platoon before. Everybody else was fresh out of bus. And when we went around and asked them, they're like, nah, no way. You guys are way too tight. And I'm, no. And so the CEO was kind of like, well, Randy, guess what? You're it. And I was the LPO before Panama even happened, which was in December of 89. We deployed in June. And I was the senior enlisted. So... That was Operation Just Cause. Just Cause. Yeah. Just for anybody that may want to do a little research on it. Yeah. So in your book, and I don't want to get, I don't want to get, tell too much about the book. You got to get the book. It's called Unwavered. Uh, Randy co-authors that with, uh, with Lucky. Um, and I'd rather you read about it because, I mean, there's, this, this is just like a movie. What we talk about here, I mean, the book is so much better, so much more uh, in detail. But you planned for more than one boat, correct? Eight boats. There was eight boats, and you had several guys that were going with you, and then it... The whole platoon was going to dive. The whole platoon was Everybody. going to dive. We practiced that stinking thing. So in the book, we talk about 70 dives. So every time we dive, we really do two dives. So they have what you call a surface interval. But we do our, we do our planned, you know, 
attack dive of some type. And either before that or after that, we, had, we did a, a dive where we practiced the basics of uh, running what we called pace line. So we had a pace line underwater 100 yards long, and we'd go down there and swim three minutes per 100 yards. So if this thing was 100 yards long, submerged, and you could dive about, it was at 15 feet-ish or so, and you'd dive, count your kicks, and make sure that your timing was within, you know, five or 10 seconds or so. So you could actually, if I had to go 600 yards, I knew that would take me 18 minutes if I, if I kicked at the right pace. And so I could actually time how far I go based on the number of kicks. So we always do that dive. Most people in, in their platoons, they would do that for the first couple of days and they'd pull that out. I made our guys do it every time, every dive. We went down and did the stupid pace line. And I hated combat swimmers, it's combat swimming. And so swimming, even though it's in the, the name, it's not. It's really diving with the compass, you know, uh, compass board, depth gauge, watch, and you're following the, following the compass at 10, 15. I like diving deeper. At that point, we can go down to 25 feet, so I'd always be between 20 and 25 feet. Um, but you're diving, following a compass, and, and following a plan that you drew on a, a chart in order to get from point A to point B, in this case, from south side to the north side of the canal and then over to where his boats were. So there were supposed to be eight boats in the water. So the whole platoon dove every time. So we were, anybody in that platoon could have done that dive off. And up to that point, SEAL team had never done a combat swimmer attack where we are diving with explosives to go blow something up. Um, were there some recons and stuff like that done before that? Maybe, but none that I, none that I know of. Were there some done after that? Sure, but there was never before an attack, direct action type mission where we're blowing something up, and they haven't done one since. So it's weird, but when we got down to Panama, there was only one boat in the water, and who do you send then? You got 16 guys, right? That's my question, keep going, guys, keep going. 15 guys, but you got, we had an extra, <coughs> but anyway, so you have this, this group of guys who are all capable of, of doing the op, but there's only one boat in the water. So you don't just send one pair, because you always dive in pairs, you're always linked with a, you know, a, a six foot piece of half inch tubular nylon from wrist to wrist so that you can't lose each other. But who he sent? And my CO, or my OIC of my platoon, Ed Coughlin and I were sitting actually in a dark room trying to get some sleep. And he's like, so who, what are we gonna do? And I go, well, I'm going. I go, me and Chris Dye, who was my dive buddy, I go, I'm, I'm going. I'm not sending one of my guys over to do a combat swimmer attack when you know, I'm the tactical, quote unquote, tactical leader of this group. I'm going. And he's like, well, I'm not, I'm not sitting it out. I'm like, well, then we know who's going. And that was a hard thing to go back to the other guys and say, it's one boat in the water, Ed and me, we're taking our dive buddies and going. So it was Ed Coughlin and TK Epley were the, the one dive pair and it was myself and Chris Dye. And Came off exactly how we had practiced it. So we, we did about 35 dives total that included 35 other dives for the pace line. So in the book, we call it, you know, how to, how to sink a boat in 70 easy steps, right? <laughs> and, it's, yeah. and it's because we, we practice and we practice until we puke and we practice the right skills and we practice the basics, but we also practice the advanced stuff. And we had op for op opposition forces, right? We had SB, SBU guys, and we had SEALs, and we had everybody walking the piers and walking the jetty and all that stuff and wherever we were at. And it's like, you need to try to find us. And they never did. You know, we were good. We were really good. Everybody in that platoon was good. So there was nobody in that platoon that we excluded for operational reasons. It was simply, you know, it had to be two pairs because one is none and two is one. And it was Ed and me, Ed and myself, that were the two leaders of the platoon, and so we were going. And this is no secret. I mean, you all use the draggers that, if, if those of you are out there like, well, why, why couldn't they see the bubbles coming up? There were no bubbles. Yeah, it's When pure, these guys dive, there's no bubbles. Pure oxygen. It's a circular, one-way circulation. It goes through soda lime. It's a soda absorb scrubber that scrubs out the CO2, and all that's left is oxygen. And you have a little bottle, and you can either let it in yourself by pushing the demand valve, or when you get down to a certain level, you have an external breathing bag. It's kind of weird, but it, it kind of counteracts 
your lungs. So when you exhale, it's going into that breathing bag, which it has to because there's still a volume of air in there and it has to go somewhere, but it expands while your lungs contract and vice versa so that your, your buoyancy really never changes. So old technology, but worked like a champ. Uh, our rigs work perfectly and it's all pure oxygen. So there's no, nothing exhaled. Everything is, is stays in that soda lime, that soda absorb scrubber, all the CO2. So, um, so you're down there like a lobster, man. There's no, so you guys plant, no bubbles. X out. Planted. We only, uh, we were really tight on time because the general put us in uh, 30 minutes later than we expected. My pair got in 35 minutes later than expected. So we had to haul some butt to get there. And I won't go through the, the whole litany of things that we had to do to make sure that we had the, the weapon armed and and that kind of thing but we ended up making it there were a few minutes to spare armed it but we weren't getting very far away because the outgoing dive was actually through a pier system and so we weren't making very far and we got maybe 400 yards away we actually went way back underneath this pier got our chest cavity out of the water i was going to ask you how far you all got and away we were there. maybe 400 yards away but by then you know so we had set that for one o'clock in the morning but they actually moved you know, H hour up. So when we, when the bomb, when the boat blew up and we were out of the water, but when we were, we were where we were, we were very safe. Nobody's, unless somebody was actually hanging out down there, which is extremely unlikely. Nobody's going to ever see us where we were getting our chest cavity out of the water. But there was so much stuff going on that we didn't even know if the boat blew up. <laughs> I mean, there was explosions everywhere. Commandant, he was getting pounded by the AC-130 and guys that were up there and so we were just I'm literally was kind of like war's on and I have no idea if that just blew up because we were using experimental clocks um, but it did went off right on time and um, at we waited a couple more minutes and then got back in the water and made it to our extract which took a long time well you answered my next question about you who how you chose who went and who didn't yeah that was it just, it was just because I was going and Ed was going. So, so you moved through your career, um, and my oldest, Chad's brother, Richie, is a JTAC in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got in touch with you, you said, yeah, hey, I ran the Navy JTAC program. I'm like, boy, is it a small world. Yeah. So talk about how all that came about. So I, I spent 11 years at Team 2 um, with some time at the center on the East Coast. And then uh, I got transferred to the West Coast to Team 3 as a chief. And I stayed at Team 3 and deployed some more. Um, and then I put on warrant officer, went to BUDS as a phase officer at BUDS. And then 9-11 happened. So I went back to 3 um in afghanistan iraq all that stuff so at the end of at the end of all of that you know now i've got over 20 years um so because i went in in 82 and now we're talking 2004 ish you know yeah. when i'm kind of uh done with all that but uh, so in a nutshell i was the training officer at team three as an ldo now not a warrant officer um <clears throat> so i was a, a, a lieutenant jg Right. Only difference in the Navy between an LDO and a warrant or a LDO and a regular line officer is a an LDO cannot be CO of a combat unit. Right. In our in our world, I could be the XO. I just couldn't be the CO. It's just weird how they did it. But same uniform, same everything as a regular officer. You just your assignments were different. But with that said, I was training officer at Team Three, and the lieutenant that was up running the JTAC course up in Fallon, Nevada, Naval Air Station Fallon. Um, got fired by the Admiral up there and they needed a quick replacement and had an extensive air ops background that kind of thing so they sent me up there no real choice it was kind of a, it was a, there was a choice there but it was no real choice so I went up there begrudgingly with the promise that I would go run the unit in Alaska because I really wanted to go be a bush pilot in Alaska um, I was going to go up to Alaska and do that, um, but they promised me, yes, three years in Fallon, and you can go to Alaska after that and run it. A friend of mine, uh, Steve Schultz, was running the unit up there. 
so I was going to replace Steve. Well, I get up to Fallon, and man, it was a mess. There was no, it was like me and one other guy, and that was it. And it was the curriculum had just been kind of put together by the guy that was there before me. And, and he did a, a decent job, but there was no, he had gotten it accredited by the Navy, but no one else. And so when I got up there, they were just forming this coalition of, of all the services getting on the same page when it came to becoming a joint terminal attack controller, or which is an old forward air controller. Uh, and so it's the guys that call the planes in to drop bombs, as your son knows so well, both your sons. Joint so, Tactical Air Command. Joint Tactical Air Controller. Controller, yeah. Right? Or attack controller. Yeah. So anyway, long story oh. short, um, I get up there, and now it's time for me to get our program accredited by not SOCOM, but accredited by the rest of the services, right? So we, in order to do that, we had to rewrite the joint pub, you know, 3093, which is the joint pub that governs all JTACery and air airdrops and whatever else you want to do with all the procedure you use. And all the services were using different procedures. Yeah, we all had the nine line, but everybody used it differently. And, and it was just a, it was a conglomerated mess. And if we were going to standardize everybody, so I got knee deep in that, ended up becoming, you know, made lieutenant and ended up becoming, you know, one of the guys that's on the joint, uh, you know, the steering committee for all the services to get all the accreditations done. We spent years getting all the services on the same sheet of music. Wow. It was, it was, a, it was a long process. So, you know, my three years comes up and we're, we're knee deep in this process. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to Alaska. And it's like, well, Steve wants to go down to Panama City to, to be the liaison guy in the Army's dive school. Why the Army dives, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Army divers, really? Um, anyway. Uh, that's what Navy SEALs are for. And Navy SEALs are actually good at it. But uh, long story short, um, he wanted to go down there. And the guy that was down there, he was delaying his departure. So Steve was delaying his departure, so they say. So they're basically like, you can stay in Fallon. Or stay in Fallon. So I stayed in Fallon. And continued down the road of that program. And every year... I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go to Alaska, you know, crickets, crickets, crickets. And finally, uh, a captain that was down at Warcom was like, you're never leaving there, dude. He goes, you, you've created a monster. So I went from me and one other guy to a building of our own and 22 people. And half of those people were aviators, you know, F-18 pilots. And we had created this huge monster, and it was awesome. And we were training both, you know, the Naval Air Forces and SEALs, all in one big old mishmash of, of happiness of uh, dropping bombs. So while I was there, um, so I'll, I'll kind of cut to the chase. I got to my six year point as being up there as this lieutenant going on lieutenant commander. And <clears throat> I still, I wanted to still go to Alaska and they were finally like, you are, you are not going to Alaska. You, we need you there because the war and this and that and the other thing. And so I'm kind of like, uh, you know, I, I want to leave. But they, they were like, no. So I said, okay, then let me retire. And they're like, no. So I put him for retirement three times, and they d disapproved it all three times. Finally, the fourth time, they finally let me retire. And, uh, and like a brain surgeon that I was at that point, I left on a Friday and came back on Monday. Left on a Friday in uniform, came on Monday as a GS and ran the program for another seven years as a GS. So total time, 34 years of uh, working for the Navy in the, in the same stupid job, basically, if you will. Um, but while I was there, man, we dropped 70,000 pieces of ordnance while I was there. 70,000 controls under my little, my little work there. We were working all the time. And people did not, SEALs didn't like it. They were expecting to go up there to shore duty, and that's cushy time. And it's like, welcome to your 12-hour days. And six days a week because we're going to be training JTEX. So holy cow, it was a lot of work, but it was good work. So. Well, there was a couple of things. <clears throat> Sorry. Kind of that I want. No, 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 <laughs> no, you're good. You went exactly where, where I wanted to go. Uh, so you take off the military uniform, put on the civvies yeah. and go to do the same job. Yeah. Then there comes a point where you know what you say, I'm done. Yeah. So you, 
And if you don't want to talk about it, this is a podcast. We we can edit this out. Mm-hmm. You had you had mentioned to me when when I was down here last time that you and I I did the same thing it, just after ten years. The anxiety of separating from the military. I mean, mm-hmm. what you've known, it, even for just ten years, but there's the brotherhood that you shared for 30 years. I mean, you guys are... There, I, I tell people, I explain to them, I said, you know what, I was... Do not call Don Shipley on me. I am not a Navy SEAL. You, nobody has ever heard me say I'm a Navy SEAL. I was a boat captain of a special warfare craft. That's it. I inserted and extracted. No more. I did get to go to some of your old schools. It was pretty good. I had to go to Bud's. Got to wear the uniform. But got a lot of the privileges, and it spoiled me. But the separate, I tell people, let me go back, that if a cabin, inside the cabin was the club, I didn't get inside the door, but I felt like I made it to the front porch. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of SWIC guys out there that want to think they're Navy SEALs. Hey, no, don't, get, don't even go there. And one of the things I got to say real quick, that amazes me by watching Don's videos is he calls these guys who were stolen valor. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the name of it? Bud's class former or, or Bud's? I forget what Don's. 131. Yeah, his, uh, his YouTube site. Remind me when you picked well, that up. That was our one. class number, 131. Yeah, 131. But he calls these guys and they can't remember a Bud class, a guy's how name you, they went through, a swim that? partner. You scream your Bud's class number like 8,000 <laughs> times a day. How do you do that? I was deployed with you guys, and you know, I still remember you guys. How do you, I mean, how how do, you, do, you do that? <laughs> right? And it's what you, everybody talks about gauging their, how old they are and how long they've been in and how cool they are and how tough their class was and all this other stuff. They go by Bud's class now. Here's one I love is when he says, oh, it's classified one. <laughs> yeah, there ain't nothing classified about that. No, no that's it's classified. I can't talk about it. Anyway, so let's go back. I digress. Talk about. The anxiety that you had there for a while, that the anxiety attacks that well, you had. Because I mean, that, that, that crap's some real, point, man. Right? Yeah, that crap's real. Some point. A lot of guys who go like and work as a GS within WARCOM or within one of the other billets that are available to GSs until they're in their 60s and stuff. But at some point, you got to say goodbye. And it ain't easy. Mm-hmm. And especially with me, man, I'm 33 years was when I said I'm going to get out. And I gave him a year warning to replace me. And, you know, to the day, I'm like, I am retiring on this day in a year, so find somebody else. They never did, and it was because they didn't believe I was going to get out because I was a GS making, you know, good money, high six figures, right, and and almost two hundred grand a year with my retirement and everything else. Um, and they're like, "No, nah, you're not going anywhere, dude," you know. But for me, it was more the I knew I needed to move on, do the next chapter in my life. I didn't want to. I didn't want to leave the the brotherhood i hate i hate it that everybody's calling it the brotherhood now but um sounds like a gang or something but um that's important to people whatever um with that said uh, i didn't i loved the environment i loved going and, and seeing the guy everybody had thick skin and you could say whatever you want and um it was a fantastic group but i knew i needed to I needed to go. And as the younger younger guys were flowing in and i would get all the really young guys in my course you know, they were every day making me more angry with their entitlement and everything else. And maybe it was just me at that point, but I knew that I needed to move on. So definitely not easy. Um, I did retire that year later. And four months after that, I had a massive anxiety attack. Thought I was having a heart attack. Massive. And ended up in the hospital. They did all the tests and they're like, and you had an anxiety attack. And I didn't even know what an anxiety attack was. I thought that was for people with anxiety. So I had no clue. Um, but yeah, it was, it was amazingly hard. And it, it probably took six years before I really was able to drop the pack and, and be, Assimilate back and be into okay you. with who I was, where I was, with what I was doing. Um, so yeah. So, I'm going to set up a little something here now. 
That's really good timing if that's lucky, by the way. Uh, that takes us pretty much right into uh, the book uh, that I want to wait and talk with you guys together on. So I've got a couple of uh, those quick fires that I shot to you. Yeah, hit me. Hit me with your best shot. Everyday carry, what do you choose? I have a SIG P320. SIG, most SEAL goes, well, I'm a Glock guy, but. I hate Glocks, hate them with a passion. Refuse I, to carry a Glock. I'm an M&P guy. Mm. I've got my first red dot too. You might want to grab a SIG P320. May want to do. I've got to also have a pig, a, a, pig, a SIG uh, uh, P365. So I've got both. Really? Sigs. I've got other guns. I got a nice, a beautiful Springfield 1911 and everything. But you ever carry 1911? It weighs like 100 pounds. <laughs> so that ain't happening. All right. Yeah. No, and I, I've sent you those pictures where we go to the range, man. I mean, my wife, she's, she's well, she'll get a cowboy. She'll get out there and start. But she shoots the same thing I do now. I had uh, went and got a little small Ruger LC or LCP 19 or LC 19. And that thing was so small, my wrist was about breaking trying to shoot it. I'm like, I'm done. So I sold it and went and got an MP. But I love it. Uh, what was your favorite port of call? Out of 30 years, everywhere you've been, do you have a favorite port of call? No, I did love going to Scotland, though. I loved it over there. Did you know I lived there for two years? Yeah, I know you lived there. Okay, saw you up in. Where was it at? What's the place where all the Navy dudes are? Oh, up in the Holy Lock. Yes. Didn't I see you in Holy Lock? Yeah. Y'all brought so, a boat around, I believe. I can't remember what we were doing. So there. anyway, I, I, so I can't swear remember, but I love, yeah. I love Scotland. We That's had a unit how I there. Yep, so. sure did. That's how I found out about you guys yeah. was uh, they brought one I of the love guys. That place. Brought, I loved it there, too. I have to say, other than Scotland, the only other place that I've been, there's two places that could come really close. One is Japan. I mean, Japan's yeah, one, of the, there, oh, so. it's one of the most beautiful places you ever want to be in your life. And the architecture plays into a lot of that. And also ADAC Alaska in the wintertime. Well, I've been to Kodiak, but... But I, it's, it's basically the same thing. Since they wouldn't ever let me go there to run the unit, <laughs> Kodiak can suck it. But, um, but no, it had to be Scotland. So. Well, I know the answer to this one. Sea Fox or Mark V? Well, I love the old Sea Fox. Uh, Mark V's faster, obviously, but I, you know how much I hate the Mark V. And uh, so I actually I'll go with Sea Fox. So. And I'll well I'll put up some pictures of both <laughs> so y'all can see. I'll go with the Sea Fox because <laughs> you can air can actually cook in the back of a Sea Fox even in rough seas. Uh, I know. I, I love it, man. I I stayed hugged up to those. Yep. Where the heat come off the. Yep. Uh, I'd be out there be bopping around waiting for you guys, and I'd be yeah. rolled up trying to stay warm. Sea Fox is definitely it. Even though, it's, even though it's a pig and can't get out of its own way. Well, the problem with the sea fox is like everything else. They took something that was supposed to be meant for insertion and extraction, and they tried to make it do everything. Yeah, and it which just, makes it heavy and slow. Yeah. Uh, did I ever tell you that I put, uh, put one of those in six inches of water? Mm, no. What's bet, that army base right there? I bet it didn't work very well. What's that army Fort base? Fort Story? Yeah, yeah, right off Fort Story. I was doing army insertions. And we, I've heard about that story, but I didn't know that was you. <laughs> yeah, it's me. So we we had went out the earlier that day and had done the beach job and determined where we want. Well, when they come and got on board, they said, "Hey, we've changed it." Like a dummy, I said, oh, "Okay." Well, with the tide, you know, it'll change the sand. Yeah. You know, it'll move it, and that's where the floating sandbar thing came from on my plaque. So it's the sand's fault. Yeah, sand man. So, man, when I turned to head down that beach, they, those Army guys said when they were jumping out, they were hitting the sand when they went out the back. And all of a sudden, woo! Yeah. And the canopy, there was two guys sitting up on the back canopy. Well, when I hit the sand, they come into the, ra <laughs> into the, into the radar mass. <laughs> they drove... A, an ambulance for me to Lucky to my boat when the tide went out. There was, when I jumped out of the boat, there was about that much water. It hit my ankles. There was a U-boat pulled up and threw us a mooring line and wanted to drag us off. Well, he almost turned the boat over on top. I said, stop, stop, stop. So me and Klein Schmidt sit there for six hours, and when the, when the tide come back in, 
Then the boat finally rolled back up and started bouncing a little bit. It had sea suction strainers where they were sea cooled, seawater cooled, pulled off the bottom. So he pulled the tops off of the strainers and would dump the or bottoms off and would dump the sand out about every 60 seconds until we got off of there. They said when they pulled that boat out of the water the next day that the, the screws, those I brass screws looked like, looked like it had been polished for about three days. But anyway, that's why they call me the sand man. I saw my... As they should. I saw my... Well, here's what happened. And I, can, I wish I could remember what the CEO's name was. He was a Navy SEAL there at SBU-20. They went to quarters that next morning and he said, I've got to pull Petty Officer Garrett's quals. You know, it's just, you know, what we do. And he took that piece of paper and laid it down. That's what I'm told. I wasn't there. And then he said, uh, he gave a speech. He said, you know, he said, I also have to understand that we want you guys to get us as close to the beach as possible because we don't want to swim any further than we have to swim. Right. He said, for that case, until further notice, I'm going to give him his quals back. <laughs> <laughs> just for the, the he, he had to take him just for, yeah. you know. Um, That's pretty funny. As a buds instructor, favorite phase? Not, not, not as a student, but as an instructor. First phase. First? Yeah. Because that's Hell Week, and I like running Hell Week. Favorite team or platoon? Team two. And this and the, is the my last My favorite one. platoon is hotel platoon. You so. better be careful this next one, because if the wife watches this, you may get stuck. Mm -hmm. If you could go anywhere in the world and observe a sunset with Gretchen, where would it be? I'd go back to Scotland. Really would. I'd love it there. So That's awesome. Yeah. Well, look, that's going to wrap up this section. Now, we've got another one. We're going to come back with Lucky and Randy a little bit later on. But, hey, thank you guys for uh, for joining the podcast. Randy, thanks again for – uh there, There's so much more. I mean, this is you – can't, you can't compress 33 years uh, into an hour, an mm -hmm. hour and 45. You just can't do it. But thank you all for joining in. Hey, please leave a, leave a comment, subscribe. Uh, we'll give a link to, to Randy and Lucky's book. It's great. I've read it twice. It's awesome. Uh, there's a lot of good in there. I think a lot of people this day and time can learn a lot from that book. And uh, thanks again. We'll see you guys in the next one.